Good morning, everybody. This is Dave Kameen coming to you directly from JPS Interoperability Solutions Incorporated. And today we're going to talk to you about JPS Roy and teach you the ins and outs of how it works. So today we're going to talk to you about what is voice over IP, VoIP. VoIP is a technique whereby voice communications can be sent across the data network using the internet protocol. So what's the internet protocol? It's a well-established standard for sending data across networks. And what's the key concept behind VoIP? It's where voice becomes data and is no different than any other data being sent across the network. So what is JPS VoIP? VoIP stands for Voice Over Internet Protocol, and JPS uses this for the extension of radios and networking. So long, long, long ago, JPS coined the term ROIP for our use, Radio Over Internet Protocol. ROIP carries not only the audio, but also the core, which means receiving a signal, and PTT, which means to key the other end. The JPS product technology family of hardware and software enables our products, communications equipment, radios, phones, consoles, recorders, satellite, etc., to be networked together across the room or around the world. The network can be an existing Ethernet LAN, local area network, or a specially installed LAN, or the internet itself. Today, I'd like to talk to you about how does ROIP work. In the lower right hand corner, you see a blue box that says A slash D. That stands for Analog to Digital Converter. And in the JPS products, all of them that deal with ROIP, they have an input, and that's an audio input, and it can be duplex or simplex, which we'll talk a little bit about later. But we're going to talk about simplex right here. I have audio coming in to the AND converter and it's going to convert the analog voice to data or digital or ones and zeros. The data then goes to the DSP and the DSP is where the secret sauce area is. It's where all the things happen like squelch type, audio processing, audio levels, audio delay, DTMF, all of these are acted upon and set appropriately. Reaching the AND converter and out to the DSP is under 2 milliseconds, typically in microseconds. Core detection in the DSP for VOX takes approximately 100 milliseconds. For VMR, voice modulation recognition detection, is typically under 180 milliseconds, and for hardware core is typically under 20 milliseconds. From the DSP, it goes to the network processor, the network processor is where the device itself that's on the internet is where the handling of the IP network is and the IP network goes then to the opposite of what we just went through. It'll go to the network processor on another device, in this case another JPS device. It'll then go to the DSP where all the things that we talked about earlier are handled and then to the DNA converter, the digital to analog converter, and back to voice. And so we talked about earlier simplex and duplex. Now you see I've added the top row going back the other way. That would make this device a duplex device. We are going to stay simple and we're going to look at a simplex device and we're going to look at audio coming in from the right hand side to the left hand side and I'm going to show you an example of what happens to the audio as we go through and the example here is greatly amplified certainly does not take as much delay as you're going to see here so that you can really see the changes but this is a good example of how audio goes from one device to another I wanted to really talk about some of the basics of radio coverage, and this is, this will is a perfect primer. I, I wanted to really talk about some of the basics of radio and coverage, and analog this will is a perfect primer to discuss uh, how we use repeaters and how do we use analog voting.
So what you saw there was the core appeared on the right hand side and the audio appeared as well. And then it went into the analog to digital converter and it changed the audio to data, ones and zeros, which it sent to the DSP. In the DSP we did all the fancy things that we talked about earlier. Then it went to the network processor which applied it to the IP network, over to the other network processor and another JPS device into the DSP where again we can apply all of the fancy things that we do and then on out to the digital to analog converter back to analog voice. And that's how JPS ROIP works. So what are the key elements of ROIP radio over internet protocol? Voice compression is one of them and that really is the vocoder. It must be deterministic and properly chosen for bandwidth versus quality trade-offs. Here's a definition of vocoder from your dictionary. It's an electronic system for analyzing the frequency spectrum of speech and constructing a code that can be transmitted and reconstructed into a replica of the original speech. And so another is the network interface management, and that must be able to handle the jitter, latency, and lost packets. So what's so great about ROIP? First, it allows more efficient use of resources. It also enables formulation of low-cost, extremely flexible radio communications networks. It multiplexes voice audio and data over a standard Ethernet network. It uses existing network infrastructure, eliminating the recurring cost of lease lines and microwave sites. And it provides centralized control of a communications network from a single computer or from many computers. What are the gotchas with ROIP? Delay, latency, and jitter are the three big ones. Delay and latency are similar terms that refer to the amount of time it takes a bit to be transmitted from source to destination. Jitter is delay that varies over time. And latency is how long a system holds onto a packet. That system may be a single device like a router or a complete communication system including routers and links. Additional audio delay is introduced by the vocoding process as well as network transit time. And vocoder issues are where voice compression may place some additional restrictions on the audio. What about radio communications? Radio communication links place some additional demands on a ROIP system. Radio communications generally require low latency or delay. Speech compression should not noticeably degrade audio, the vocoder. Transmit control and receive status, core and PTT are needed. And the solution requires high MTBF in many applications. That's mean time between failure. Let's talk about JPS ROIP with radios. In this example, the Z2 unit connects communications equipment to a digital network using ROIP, Radio Over Internet Protocol. This multiplexes voice audio, core, and PTT over a standard Ethernet network. JPS has excellent audio quality with our lowest vocoder, which uses only 15 kHz of bandwidth with overhead while audio passes. So let's talk about the vocoder settings that JPS provides. They are settings 1 through 5. 1 is GSM 13 kilobits per second and about 2 kilobits extra for core and PTT. This is suitable for voice communications. It really should not be used for any tone signaling. It offers great compression with reasonable voice quality. As you head down to scale to number 5, you see PCM 64 kilobits per second. That's suitable not only for voice, but also for some tone signaling. It offers the highest quality of all the compression methods, but provides the least compression. So you can probably see 
your choices are bandwidth versus voice quality. And the GSM 13 kilohertz per second vocoder works fantastic for radio systems. Let's look at JPS ROIP with radios. It uses existing network infrastructure, eliminating the need for lease lines and microwave sites. It eliminates the requirement for pilot tones and other in-band signaling. In the JPS product at one end, usually the equipment end is the server. The one at the other end, usually the operator end, is the client. So how do JPS products create the end-to-end -end network link? Modules link to other modules as a client or a server. In this example, we're using an ACU 2000. Notice that we're pointing at the first DSP2 module, and that DSP2 module we are configuring as a hybrid. Hybrid means that we're going to be using ROIP coming in through the IP connector, and that can be cross-patched into the other DSP modules or other modules within the 2000. We've also configured it as a server and what that means is that that DSP2 module does not go and look for anything it's waiting for another device to connect to it as the client. Note the job of the server is to wait for our client to connect to it. So let's remember we have our hybrid DSP2 server set to 192.168.138 and now we're going to look at the DSP2 web configuration. So here we're going to look at the DSP2 web configuration. The important items are the ones that affect us on the IP side of the DSP2 and so let's start with the first one and that is this unit is a server. So it's going to be waiting to be contacted by a client somewhere over a network. To the right of that, you can see the standard IP address, subnet mask, gateway IP configuration information that applies to all products on the internet. Notice that the DSP2 is the IP address that we mentioned, 192, 168, 138. And down below, we're also noticing that the DSP2 mode is in the hybrid mode, which means we cross-patch the IP to other DSPs or other modules within the 2000. How does the DSP2, NXU, Z2, or any of the JPS products create the end-to-end -end network link? A module links to another module as a client or a server. We remember that we've designated the DSP2 within the 2000 as a hybrid server with address 138 and we've designated the NXU2A. It can also be a DSP2, it can be any JPS product, a Z2, T, an M, it really doesn't matter. So what's going to happen here is we've configured the NXU2 as a client we tell the client which server to connect to and it's the job of the client to search for the server or a specific server to connect to. So let's remember this, the NXU2 client is a 192.168.100.8 IP address and the server IP as we know already is the DSP2 module with the 100.38 address. Now let's talk about the client web configuration utility. We're going to use the NXU2A. The unit is a client as we've been discussing and to the right is the IP information. 192.168.108 is the IP address of this NXU2. Subnet master 255.255.255.0 and it has a remote IP to talk to the DSP2 module and that is the DSP2 module's IP address 192.168.138. Automatically the client searches the network for a specific server and we can see that doing here. It's just going out to the network, going through a server and it's searching the network for the IP address 
of the DSP-2 module, which is 192, 168, 138. And when it finds it, as we see there, it'll turn on the link active LED and VoIP, VoIP data can be transported between the devices. Let's talk about the PC NXU console. The console is a software client application allowing a computer user to use a PC as a communication asset, two-way, both transmit and receive. The PC NXU console will associate to JPS products which possess the ROIP capability. The integral PTT button will allow interaction with remote radio systems. As we can see in the diagram below, we have a donor radio attached to a ACU 2000. That's the host site. The use of the ROIP allows the PC NXU console to be remotely located on a computer. And you can see the PC NXU application in the middle of the screen here. And when the link active LED is on, then it is able to key and talk in the microphone and unkey and listen to the receive audio of the radio at the distant end of the 2000. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you are now a JPS ROIP expert. Congratulations.